So I think from here on out, because my life is still kind of crazy, I'm still making maps, but I'm feeling like some of these more informal conversations are about all I can do for now, and it seems like people are getting some stuff out of it. So rather than the more formal presentations, I'm just going to kind of talk to you about sort of what's going on in my life and how I'm thinking about things, and I'm going to presume that um, uh, ultimately people will find... Uh, things that they take away that are useful. Because I've, I've talked to some people and they're like, it's kind of amazing all of the synchronicities of the things you're talking about and the things that are happening in my life. So I'm just gonna take that as a sign to, to go with that. Um, and so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, a cool trip uh, a friend, um, my friend Juliana and I took out to Lancaster County and how that sort of overlaps with some thinking I've been doing around Swedenborg and esoteric Islam. And um, just if people are wondering how I'm doing in my regular life, the, the for sale sign just went on, went up on my stoop outside. They came and tied it up today. And um, so it feels a little weird. Um, you know, I texted my husband in the realtor. I'm like, oh, the sign's up. And he's super excited because I guess for him, it's like a game of what comes next because he's already started his what's next thing. Um, but for me, it feels a little weird. And actually, the sign guy, it's its not a metal sign. It's just one of those um, corrugated plasticky kind of signs. So if it flies around, it's very windy today. I'm assuming it, it won't hurt anybody. Uh, but he's like, maybe I could just attach it to the pole tighter. And I'm like, oh, I think that's going to make it flap around. So it's just sort of free flying in the breeze um, right outside the window. And I guess uh, waving me into the next phase. So, yeah. So, um so uh, on, gosh, I guess it was Wednesday, um, my friend Juliana, we had uh, connected about a year ago and we went on sort of an amazing uh, day walking around New York City setting intentions at places like Bloomberg Philanthropies and Rose, the FDR Monument at Roosevelt Island and downtown in um, near uh, sort of ground zero 9-11 in New York City Hall, and we were making beautiful hearts. And um, my friend who had sent me these beautiful sound bowls, I had just sort of gotten them, so I would, had one of them, and I was we were using our, the gongs, and <clears throat> it was pretty great. Squirrel nest. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yay. <laughs> Reloader. <laughs> Oh, fun. <laughs> Um, including we were in Central Park with these big, big boulders, and I was holding one of the um, bowls, and I and I hit it, but I accidentally like touched it against the edge of the rock, these big boulders, and it like resonated like crazy. And so, you know, it just sort of hit home about all of the frequency stuff. Send it to me. Okay. Econ, we're hitting the bowl and then touching the rock. <laughs> So hit it one more time. It's really cool. We're in Central Park. So cool. We're working with nature here. <laughs> so, um, anyway, it had been a bit, and uh, Juliana got back in touch, and she's like, I just feel like I'm supposed to come and see you before and see Philadelphia, reconnect with Philadelphia before you go. Uh, and so, yeah, so she came down and uh, we planned a day trip, but it was very, very rainy here on Wednesday. And so initially we were gonna go around the city, but rather than just walking through the city, I had been really feeling in my heart that I wanted to go see Ephrata Cloister uh, before I leave the area. It had been years and years. Um, and Conrad Beisel was um, sort of a German mystic, you know, Christian mystic, who had um, immigrated to uh, 
to the U.S. and come initially to see uh, Kelpius and the monks of the Wissican, but Kelpius had already died and that community had kind of dissipated. And so he kept going and he ultimately went out to um, Lancaster County and set up a community called Ephrata. And evidently Ephrata is in the Bible and it's the original name of Bethlehem before it was Bethlehem. Um, and so the community that he set up there, it's a now a state historic site called Ephrata Cloister. And so it was a mix of an, a celibate intentional community that had these huge timber frame buildings that are like six stories tall. Evidently for many years, they were the tallest buildings west of Philadelphia in the United States. Um, very European looking, very slopey, slopey roofs, all hand hewn. And there was a big building for the brothers and then a big building for the sisters. And uh, they ran a very successful printing business and crafts. They also, they were all literate and because they were a part of the pietist sect, so reading the Bible and having an individual experience with God was super important. Each of the brothers and sisters had their own little room um, in the big building, and each of the rooms had its own window of natural light. And very, they were ascetic, so um, very basic. They only ate one meal a day and was vegetarian, and they slept on a little wooden bench without a pillow or any blankets. And most of the time they didn't wear shoes, except I guess in the winter maybe they wore shoes. And, um, and they prayed a lot. So during the day they would do these handcrafts. They also did fracture, uh, which is a certain kind of um, calligraphy um, that interestingly enough was based on a font that was created by, um, in connection with like Maximilian I commissioned Albrecht Durer to do this printing, this woodblock printing of a triumphal arch. So it was, all these pages that you would put together like hundreds of pages to make this big triumphal arch and it was covered in text and so there was a special font developed for that particular project and that was called Fraktur and for many many years uh, that was sort of the go-to German font and so the uh, brothers and sisters at Ephrata Cloister would do calligraphy of Bible verses and again sort of the Pennsylvania Dutch hearts and birds and um, it's interesting because Conrad Beisel, who was the leader of the community, um, he was very likely sort of influenced by Jakob Burma, um, who and sort of Christian theosophy and the importance of the heart and love. So now that you think, if you sort of think back about a lot of like Pennsylvania toll painting uh, with the, the hearts and then also the birds sort of quantum biology, that's, that's an interesting connection. Um, so the thing about Beisel is that he was a poet. Um, I, I think originally he was a shoemaker. No, was he a shoemaker? No, that was, Burma was a shoemaker. Um, well, I'm not sure what he did before he became a mystical leader of a celibate community, um, but he wrote many, many hymns and poems, like 700 hymns. And um, so I, I just wanted to sort of take a minute and say like something I'm trying to puzzle through with you guys is that I feel like this next phase of what I'm trying to sort out about this stuff, it's deeply connected to spirituality. And, you know, I, I think I've mentioned before on the like ant, faith-based ant computers that I do believe that, that religious stories and religious, um, not stories meaning that they're not true, but the way we understand faith-based practices and the texts that go along with those and the rituals that go along with those and the songs that go along with those um, are very, very powerful. And on the one hand, like that's a, a huge teeming behavior, right? We've seen this across the millennia of great um, physical violence between groups that disagree on religious grounds or policy wise, right? You know, the, um, uh, you know, people eliminating other people because they don't believe the right way or forced conversions. Um, and my position, and I, I think I've made this clear, but like I feel in my heart, and this is just me, um, like I believe in a benevolent creative force of the universe. And I believe that I wouldn't want a one world religion, even if it happened to be the religion like if, you know, if I had one and it was like mine, I still think I wouldn't want a one world religion because culture is so invested in religion and your place in the world and, um, you know, liturgical practice and music and being and food. And it's all very unique to different 
situations. And so I, I wouldn't want that to all be erased and to be some sort of uniform world culture. And um, so, but at the same time, like I respect all of them individually. And I think that there's many ways to accomplish our divine purpose here. Um, and my preference would be that individual groups of people would not harm one another in the name of religion. And that again, we would hold our, the institutions of faith uh, accountable to um, the overall concerns in a non-hierarchical way. Um, that said, the tricky thing about all of this is that the system that's going ahead with the decentralization and the blockchain and the religion as an API and all of that is based in the ecumenicalism movement. And again, that goes back to the United Religions Initiative and Gates and the Hawk. And, you know, when Jason and I went to Salt Lake City, and actually I went first by myself and then we went back and we filmed it, um, in the Magdalene Cathedral in Salt Lake City, so the Catholic Cathedral, they had this special chapel that they had uh, adapted for Vatican II and put in two stained glass windows. And one of them was the church turning its face to the modern world. And the, uh, the symbolism for that was the UN's flat earth logo. And they literally say that in their pamphlet. Um, but then the second one was the ecumenicalism. And it was interesting because it was a ship and a, a boat on an ocean. So I'm not sure people who are more involved in faith-based practice if that's common, that's, that's understood as the symbol of ecumenicalism. But um, so that's where things are going too. Okay, we are here in um, the Cathedral of the Madeline in Salt Lake City. This is the only cathedral uh, to Mary Magdalene in North America. And uh, it's important because there's actually a side chapel uh, off the lobby of this building that is called um, the Our Lady of Zion Chapel. And I'm just gonna read the description here. Chapel of Our Lady of Zion, formerly the baptistry. The chapel also houses the statue acquired in 1993 in Madonna and Child by Utah art artist Arvard Fairbanks. It also contains eight original stained glass windows and two new windows that were installed in 1993. The two new windows celebrate the most important achievements of the Second Vatican Council. The ecumenical movement, symbolized by the standard ecumenical emblem, and the church's commitment to dialogue with the modern world, symbolized by the United Nations symbol and the words Lumen Gentium, referring to the church as the light unto nations. The statue of St. Mary Magdalene, carved in the late 1940s by Canadian artist Gordon Newby, is also housed in this room. And so this is important about Vatican II. Uh, and the United Nations, that all of the impact investing is going to be tied to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are about managing impoverished populations uh, in coordination with, I guess, sustainability and green programs. And, you know, it's not a small thing to put two new stained glass windows in a masonry cathedral. Um, so to have this direct reference to the United Nations and also turning to the modern world. So last year, the Vatican hosted an event called Unite to Prevent with the Cura Foundation, where they were essentially talking about the unification of the body and the soul with advanced technologies, advanced medical technologies, and setting up um, what appeared to be very much a post-human, uh, human plus uh, future. The advertising uh, of the event was the Michelangelo, God, and Adam touching hands, uh, but they had latex gloves. And so it's sort of the, the capture of that sacred connection into the medical industrial complex. Um, I will also say that there were at least four high-ranking members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who attended that event among many celebrities and other guests. And so it, there is this connection between, um, in the biotechnology space, between the church's faith, impact investing, and the United Nations. And I think in many respects it's, it's captured in this, this stained glass window with the UN, especially connecting to light, light of the world. Um, illumination and um, photonics and nanoelectronics and how that all fits together. So um, it's a beautiful setting, but the message of that's delivered in that cha chap uh, in the chapel of Our Lady of Zion, which again, there are many connections between Salt Lake City and Israel, and Israel is a leader in the biotechnology space as well. And so how do we navigate, one, like the importance of spiritual practice to all of this? Because as I've mentioned before, you know, when you see the amount of money that the Templeton Foundation, um, and again, John Templeton was ostensibly Presbyterian, 
um, which I guess their main training center is in Princeton, which is interesting with the physics. And he was knighted by the queen uh, for his good works. He, he gave up his American citizenship. He made a bunch of money in mutual funds and then uh, moved over to the Bahamas and became a citizen of the Bahamas and was knighted by the queen for his good work for the empire. So we know something was going on there with that, you know, nice free market Presbyterian guy who's funding free markets and character and religion and uh, free market economics and, and all of that. And it's not just eugenics. It's not something ideological, something bigger. And one of his big projects <clears throat> that he funded for many, many years was something called Meta Nexus, which was based in University City in West Philadelphia, which was sort of the first urban technological park. <clears throat> so, and, you know, working with Fetzer Institute and knowing that that's the spiritualism and the frequency. Um, so yeah, so how do we how do we talk about it when we know that on the one hand we don't want canned ecumenicalism a la Bill Gates, but on the other hand, we don't necessarily, in my opinion, I I would prefer not to pick one religion and, and set that up front, or to be able to talk broadly about religious aspects um, and not have people immediately assume what that what I'm saying is from a place of negativity or judgment. Because I do think that spiritual practice and faith practiced individually and collectively is very important. Um, so that's sort of what I'm saying, just to, to sort of lay this out. And that's sort of what was on my mind when I went to Ephrata Cloister. And when I was looking at the, um, the book Stealing Fire by Jamie Wheel, he was a co-author. In one of his interviews, he was talking about ethical cults and the importance of ethical cults. Manson family or the Jim Jones drink the Kool-Aid side, but from, you know, religious studies or anthropology, a cult is literally just a community of practice um, bonded together around some shared ep epiphanic, you know, or revelatory experience. Basically, it's any religious group that doesn't yet, that is not yet state sanctioned is a cult. So the question is, is we know there are dysfunctional ones. We know there are lots and lots of unethical cults, particularly where leaders hijack um, money, power, sexuality, and control. And you mean pick, pick any two and you're done, you know? So the question is, is rather than steering away from that and, as, and, and saying that won't happen or it shouldn't happen or, or um, that's not what we're doing, steer into it and say, okay, if we're going to build vibrant communities of practice, how do we build ethical cults? And, and what I would imagine, and, and that's clearly a conversation for us all to figure out, but what I would imagine is that you know, we, we've seen this movie before. We know how this goes badly wrong. And we've had about a half century of, you know, Eastern hierarchical lineage traditions getting buggered up and bastardized and imported into the West and, and varying kind of gurus with feet of clay stepping up to lead children's crusades, you know, that all just go off the cliff. And so the question would be, if we're trying to build ethical cults, A, you know, are they experimental and experiential so that there is no dogma or doctrine to buy into? Are they decentralized so that people maintain their own common sense, their own judgment, and their own agency? And, and are they um, pointed towards, I would hope, some sort of social good or, or action? And, 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 can you, and, and all of the, the known issues of dysfunctional cults, can we just say, hey, let's just forever be vigilant about shared in groups, about specific vernacular, about an inside outside group mentality, about mediated access to ecstasy, right? And that's another kicker because almost in every single one of those situations where it does go wrong, that group does something together that creates a state experience that they come to believe is exceptional, special, and quite often is doled out or tightly controlled by the person in charge. And so if we create distributed access, two techniques of ecstasy, so everybody is on their own recognizance, you know, and responsible for having access to these things, integrating them and growing them. There are no fish stories to swallow, so it's, it's open source meaning making, um, and there's no sage on the stage, there's nobody up front that has lopsided uh, truth or authority claims that maybe we have the chance, and then also, you know, a great one from a lot of religious traditions that seems to get skipped these days, is an ethic of service. Are we doing something with this? Or are we just kind of crawling up our asses and engaging in endless self-development?
So that would be my hope, is that, is that ethical cult building is the game of how do we create lots of nodes, all of which are unique and different from each other. They all form with their own kind of local DNA and particular missions and purposes. They may even have their own belief systems, but we can say um, ecstasis, the peak experience, catharsis, the healing, and communitas um, become the kind of three-legged stool that you can basically build tightly knit, highly collaborative, uh, functional and effective small communities around. And cults in and of itself is a pretty charged word. But, you know, an intentional community with a faith-based purpose. And I'm looking at Effort of Cloister and I'm like, yep, that would be categorized as an ethical cult. And that would be a super organism um, in many respects with sort of kundalini aspects, right? It's celibate, but you have the, the feminine on one side and the masculine on the other. And um, in their belief was that every night they would wake up um, between midnight and 2 a.m. to pray, and they anticipated to be taken up into heaven and that the women would be um, brides of Christ and that the men would be husbands of Sophia, and it would be a, a heavenly mystical union um, from that. And, and ultimately, I, I don't think that that happened the way that they anticipated and eventually be, being a celibate community. Um, the, the community died out. It was taken over by some sort of German-related um, Christian practice till the 30s, until they sort of died out, and then the state took it over um, in the early 40s as a historic site. Regarding universal basic income, so both the Moravians, I think the Moravians and the Effort of Cloister were aligned with the pietist group, and the idea that you were, through your own piety, your own religious work, that you could have direct connection to God, that it diminished the intermediation of the institutional hierarchy of religion. Um, and a lot of that was inspired by Jan Hus, who predated Luther in terms of the Protestant pushback against the Vatican, um, and then was eventually burned at the stake for heresy. Um, but the Pietists sort of came out of that tradition of the Jan Hus tradition. And um, the thing that I wanted to bring in was to mention a little bit about this Bertelsmann Stiftung group, which is a multinational media marketing group, now digital media group. And it actually had gotten its start. Um, it says here that it's, um, it is one of the world's largest media conglomerates encompassing subsidiaries that span music, broadcasting, print, and the internet. And they're operating in 60 countries. And in U.S., um, they, they purchased Random House, one of the world's largest book and publishing companies, and that they own uh, record labels including RCA Music Group, Arista, BG Areola, BMG Japan. Um, so they're a very, very big company. Uh, but they were originally started in the middle of the 19th century, which is still fairly recent. It's not 18th or 16th century, uh, 17th century. Uh, but in the middle of the 19th century, uh, Bertelsmann, um, essentially started out as a publisher of pietist hymnals. So there's this pietist connection. And again, the pietism, like the Moravians, were called the unitas fratrum, so like the unified brotherhood. So when I'm talking a little bit about like a one world religion, I think there is an interest in, you know, in certain groups of having like a unified religious presence. <clears throat> and so unitas fratrum would have been one of that Along those lines, I'm not saying that they wanted a new world order, but the the aspiration that all brothers would be together in this sort of religious context. Um, and Bertelsmann was doing a publication of their hymnals. So again, this is, you know, quite a bit after uh, Beisel has already passed on, but it is in the same tradition of frequency, harmony, and religious publications. And so... Um, it says they began in 1835 as a small publisher of evangelical hymn books and devotional pamphlets in pietist Eastern Westphalia, and their headquarters is still there. Um, and so that's uh, Bertelsmann, and then they got into publishing, and then they got into popular music, and then they got now they're in 60 countries, and it's not just print media or records, or <clears throat> it's all of the digital. And right, that's the the. Digital artifacts are the stigmergic consciousness management piece. So, um, and in addition, um, it says that Bertelsmann, in addition to revolutionizing book distribution, they actually helped initiate commercial television in Germany. So uh, very much into consciousness management. Um, and then they, they were involved in Germany fairly recently in something called the Hartz Laws, I'm not sure why this is not 
clicking over for me. The Hart's Law. So um, this was punitive welfare reform, kind of a la the Clintons, um, and the idea that if you were laid off of work, again, that you had to take any kind of work that was available. And so in one of the articles, they were talking about like a woman who was a teacher, like an elementary school teacher, and she had been trying to get work. And the one job that was available was to like work as a like a, a counter assistant in like a porn shop. And they were like, well, you have to do that. And she's like, well, I don't want to do that. And so they were very punitive. And the Berlsmann um, Stiftung uh, were behind these Hartz laws. So um, I'll just read this. This is... Um, an article from The Nation, um, Germany's Working Poor. Uh, this is from 2017. The, German now face the Germans now face the highest number of impoverished workers in a decade, thanks to the draconian Hartz IV unemployment laws. And so, oh, no, that's not it. Okay, so this is the quote that I pulled out. Um, yet Hartz played only a supporting role in Schroeder's reforms. He chaired the commission whose work served as their basis, but the Bertelsmann Foundation, Germany's most influential media group, was the main director of operations. Its philanthropic, air quotes, work was central to the development of Agenda 2010. It financed expert assessments, distributed press packages, and networked to promote, quote unquote, goodwill. Helga Spindler, a professor of public law at the University of Duisburg Essen, wrote, without the Bertelsmann Foundation's preparation, support, and after sales work at every level, the Hartz Commission's proposals and their transformation into law could never have happened. The foundation even took the 15 members of the commission on steady trips to countries considered to have an avant-garde approach to repurposing the unemployed in Denmark, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Austria, and the United Kingdom. And um, so then they were working on like change agent modules for the unemployed. And of course, we know that that's where things are going with automation and AI. And so, and again, they're managing consciousness, they're managing media, it's not just propaganda, they're literally using their money to, to do all of that. Now they have, um, Berlschmann Stiftung is their independent foundation uh, that's based in Washington, and it was created in Washington, D.C. in 2008 uh, to work on, to focus on audiovisual and multimedia content. And I would say that that process of managing consciousness as a group through stigmergic online artifacts is part of how the ant computer is going to operate. Um, so let's see, here is, it's talking about universal basic income uh, during, after the lockdowns. Uh, by May 20 of 2020, public support for UBI, universal basic income, reached astonishing levels. A poll of 12,000 people across EU countries, also including the United Kingdom, conducted by Oxford's European Study Centers, in consultation with their Belgium. Bertelsmann Foundation revealed 71% of Europeans favored a state-funded UBI, okay? So you, you, you make people redundant, you take away their employment and their, their, the purpose of work in their lives, and then you move them into draconian sort of trauma-enacted um, policies, government policies, and then you offer them a UBI as a way out because the UBI is going to be the signal, right, where the, the biophysics and the econophysics Inter interface. And again, just pointing out that this Bertelsmann company, now a, a multinational 60 country digital media company, started out in 1835 publishing hymnals and religious tracts for the pietists. And the story goes, um, for many years, they said that they um, were punished by the Nazis for not going along with uh, the regime. But in fact, uh, quietly, many of the high level um, executives with the company were working in collaboration and funding uh, the Nazis, you know, in, in the 30s and 40s. So um, yeah, so they're working now in uh, digital media investments. Uh, so they it, they talk about uh, partnering with emerging technology companies to make industry connection and drive business development uh, in next generation media, which is using unique content, technology, and monetization models, uh, including Web3, okay, and FinTech. So uh, Bertelsmann is deeply involved in the FinTech and uh, Web3, the attention token economy. Um, and so this... Um, Emerging Tech Digital Platform was started in 2006 with $180 million in flexible investing in these various kinds of online media content. Um, and 
you know, I, I sort of liken this to, um, okay, so one of their investments was Flow Sports, uh, which is uh, streaming uh, of live sports services. And uh, Flow Sports, the CEO and co-founder of Flow Sports is Mark Floriani. And um, Mark Floriani, uh, let's see, it says uh, they raised $47 million. This is in 2019, just leading into, you know, the world changing. Uh, a direct-to-consumer stream of live digital sport and original content. Um, so Discovery Inc. gave them a bunch of money for underserved communities and specialty sports like hockey, wrestling, and volleyball. So in flow sports, I think we need to consider fascia and liquid crystal in computing. Um, and again, streaming and taking advantage of people who aren't doing cable, right? Who are doing direct streaming to, uh, to their computers. Um, so one of the main um, donors to that was the uh, Berlsmann. And so here is the article about that. Uh, in Austin, again, Flow Sports, as well as Rockfin, uh, both based in Austin, uh, Discovery Inc. is their round. Um, it, so it says, uh, June 3rd, 2019, Flow Sports, the innovator in live digital sports and original content, announced the close of its Series C funding with $47 million raised to expand and enhance coverage in new and existing sports. Led by current investor Discovery Inc., the round also included participation from existing Flow Sports financial investors, Causeway Media Partners, LP, uh, Fertita Capital, and DCM Ventures, as well as strategic investors, World Wrestling Entertainment, Inc., and Berlsmann Digital Media Investments. Okay, so Berlsmann is investing in Flow Sports. And again, Martin Floriani, so wrestling is part of that. And then um, Martin Floriani is also a um, uh, co-founder of Rockfin. We've got Berlsmann, right? So Berlsmann, Pius his hymnals, working on punitive welfare laws, UBI, and former collaborators with the uh, Nazi regime. Uh, now into multinational digital media, um, among their many investments, including Flow Sports, which uh, the co-founder of that is Martin Floriani, who also is the CEO of Rockfin. Um, so again, I had my issues with Rockfin before, but I think we're getting clearer on what the problem is. So here's Martin Floriani's uh, CEO at Rockfin since uh, May of 2018, and here he is, founder of Flow Sports in 2006 to 2018. Uh, so Beryl is a direct connection into that. Um, and then one of the things about uh, Flow Sports was specifically wrestling, which is interesting when we think about the whole classical antiquity and Greece and fascia. Um, so we've got, you know, Rockfin, which is a, an attention token economy platform, and then they're paid in these Ray tokens, which, again, is sort of ha has allusions to... Um, you know, uh, the sun god and a little bit of Mithric stuff. And then according to their own documentation that, that the name Rockfin is named for the wild orca, the fin on the top of a wild orca. And then if it's like vibrant, it's supposed to be, um, you know, uh, in good shape and this uh, not floppy, just firm, I guess. And so the wild orcas, of course, they uh, they travel in pods and pod is a word you hear a lot. Actually, I was talking to Juliana and she was saying, yeah, pod is a word they use a lot in um, Burning Man. And then pause, pod is also connected to this solid Tim Berners-Lee and this idea of a personal online data store pods. So you've got whale pods and you've got data pods and distributed identity pods and you've got attention a token, a ten, token attention economy pods, you know, and of course, um, you know, Rockfin is based in Austin where they're doing, you know, a lot of this, uh, you know, nude smart city digital innovation. It's not just Dallas, it's also Austin. So I wanted to take a minute and just bring in this connection between UBI, welfare and digital media and, you know, how this sort of fits into like the idea of the, the 15 million merit uh, Black Mirror TV show. But this idea of the super organism and the importance of, so they were doing hand, you know, thinking about what I was saying the last time about Mr. Curtis and the museums, the Mercer Museum and objects and story. Uh, they were very much involved in handmade items, making furniture, uh, weaving, redding linen and weaving linen cloth, uh, printing. And again, that's its own technology, right? The technology of the printing press, but then the technology of the literacy um, and the, the images that went along with the fracture. Um, they were, were doing basket making. Um, 
sort of all, you know, all of these different hand things. And many of these artifacts are, you know, 300 years old and they're, they're still there in the historic site. Um, so I can sort of imagine Ephrata Cloister being one of these early spiritual superorganisms and, and what that means. Um, so then on the other hand, before we went to Ephrata, that was the second half of the day, um, we were, oh, and I forgot. So uh, there was a brief museum exhibit that we walked through. And uh, actually, I think that it's on the Copalico Creek, uh, which was an Indian name for den of serpents. <laughs> so that, that particular creek was known for a lot of snakes. <laughs> and they, they had images of the, the fracteur and uh, some of the white, they all wore white. And um, I had a friend who was, pointing out, you know, I mentioned this, the celibacy and the vegetarianism and the white outfits. And they're like, oh, that seems a lot like the Essenes. Um, and, you know, I knew of the Essenes from the Neil Stevenson book, uh, Snow Crash, that created the, the metaverse, because the Essenes play a role in the, uh, the, the story arc of that when the main character um, is speaking to the AI librarian. and He's explaining about the Namshubs and the Essenes. They were constantly bathing themselves, lying naked under the sun, purging themselves with enemas, and going to extreme lengths to make sure that their food was pure and uncontaminated. They even had their own versions of the Gospels, in which Jesus healed possessed people not with miracles, but by driving parasites such as tapeworm out of their body. These parasites are considered to be synonymous with demons. They sound kind of like hippies. The connection has been made before, but it is faulty in many ways. The Essenes were strictly religious and would never have taken drugs. So to them, there was no difference between infection with a parasite, like tapeworm, and demonic possession. Correct. Interesting. I wonder what they would have thought about computer viruses. Speculation is not in my ambit. Speaking of which, Lagos was babbling to me about viruses and infection and something called a namshub. What does that mean? Namshub is a word from Sumerian. Sumerian? Yes, sir. Used in Mesopotamia until roughly 2000 BC, the oldest of all written languages. Oh, so all the other languages are descended from it. For a moment, the librarian's eyes glance upward as if he's thinking about something. This is a visual cue to inform Hero that he's making a momentary raid on the library. Actually, no, the librarian says. No languages whatsoever are descended from Sumerian. It is an agglutinative tongue, meaning that it is a collection of morphemes or syllables that are grouped into words. Very unusual. You are saying, Hero says, remembering David in the hospital, that if I could hear someone speaking Sumerian, it would sound like a long stream of short syllables strung together? Yes, sir. Would it sound anything like glossolalia? Judgment call. Ask someone real, the librarian says. Does it sound like any modern tongue? There is no provable genetic relationship between Sumerian and any tongue that came afterward. That's odd. My Mesopotamian history is rusty, Hero says. What happened to the Sumerians? Genocide? No, sir. They were conquered, but there's no evidence of genocide per se. Everyone gets conquered sooner or later, Hero says. But their languages don't die out. Why did Sumerian disappear? Since I'm just a piece of code, I would be on very thin ice to speculate, the librarian says. Okay. Does anyone understand Sumerian? Yes. At any given time, it appears that there are roughly ten people in the world who can read it. Where do they work? One in Israel, one at the British Museum, one in Iraq, one at the University of Chicago, one at the University of Pennsylvania, and five at Rife Bible College in Houston, Texas. Nice distribution. And have any of these people figured out what the word namshub means in Sumeria? Yes, a namshub is a speech with magical force. The closest English equivalent would be incantation, but this is a number of incorrect connotations. Did the Sumerians believe in magic? 
The librarian shakes his head minutely. This is the kind of seemingly precise question that is in fact very profound, and that pieces of software, such as myself, are notoriously clumsy at. Allow me to quote from Kramer, Samuel Noah, and Mayer, John R. Myths of Enki, the Crafty God, New York, Oxford, Oxford University Press, 1989. Quote, Religion, magic, and medicine are so completely intertwined in Mesopotamia that separating them is frustrating and perhaps futile work. Sumerian incantations demonstrate an intimate connection between the religious, the magical, and the aesthetic so complete that any attempt to pull one away from the other will distort the whole. End quote. There is more material in here that might help explain the subject. In where? In the next room the librarian says, gesturing at the wall. He walks over and slides the rice paper partition out of the way. A speech with magical force. Nowadays, people don't believe in these kinds of things, except in the metaverse, that is, where magic is possible. The metaverse is a fictional structure made out of code, and code is just a form of speech, the form that computers understand. The metaverse in its entirety could be considered a single vast NAMSHUB, enacting itself on L. Bob Reif's fiber optic network. Um, so the, the, the Effort of Cloister did worship on um, Saturday. So I know some people have talked about them being like maybe conversos or something like that. Um, but the Essene the angle is, is pretty interesting. Um, so one of the displays... Um, Actually, it was an archaeological, it was an artifact that was buried three feet underground, and it was found in the early 1990s, and it was a glass trumpet. And so it was a, it was about the size of a trumpet, like, you know, three feet long, I don't know exactly how, but, well, maybe, like, longer than, like, a short little trumpet, like, it was, it was pretty long. And, um, yeah, so it was this trumpet, and it was glass, sort of like, almost like a Coke kind of like not dark green, but like a greenish clear. And it was just broken in a couple places, but it had been carefully buried three feet underground and nobody knows still what it was. But it's interesting for me to think about the trumpet because when I had that weird day talking about the, um, uh, the, mer the oh gosh, what was it? The, um, the Ethereum merge when they went from proof of work to proof of stake, um, that day that I was in Morristown, New Jersey, and I went to the swamp, and there was the, the guy taking out his trumpet to go play it in the swamp, the uh, tequila, um, you know, thinking about the trumpet and, and the role of the trumpet and all of that. Between Belcor and this site, I stopped in at the Great Swamp National Wildlife Refuge, which was interesting. Um, they just had a boardwalk that went out about half a mile into the swamp, and there wasn't a lot of standing water. I mean, it's August, so, um, you know, such as it is, uh, wasn't, wasn't soup. It was, you know, you can tell, you can tell it was a swamp because lots of the trees were, um, like perched up on their tippy toes. Um, but it, there wasn't a whole lot going uh, like on water wise in the swamp, but it was nice to walk through and it's very green, um, when it, where it wasn't muddy and then, um, lots of ferns and lots of moss. And, uh, because I was up on the boardwalk, I couldn't actually collect a lot of things, but I collected some beautiful red leaves and a little bit of fern and a little bit of, uh, one fungi, a purple one, which was kind of cool. And, um, and like some turkey fan sort of fungus. And um, yeah, and so I brought out a few things. And, um, and it's interesting because I was getting into my car. Now this whole part of um, New Jersey that I've never really been in, because New Jersey is a small state, but it's very eclectic. And uh, so this is sort of, you know, the Northern half and the Western half. And so it's very, very, she, she. Very, very nice big houses, some very big estates. It seems like sort of horse country, lots of horse fences and equestrian zones and, you know, golf centers and various things out here. Um, you know, very affluent. But in the middle of it is this giant swamp. And it, it's, it's not an open swamp. It's a very wooded swamp, but it's, it's a huge amount of open space. And so where we're at in Nokia Labs, it's probably only about it's five seven miles from the, the Great Swamp uh, Wildlife Refuge. Um, so I got some things in my basket and you know I'm getting ready to get back in my car and I see that there's this young guy getting some stuff out of his car. Actually, I bumped into him at the way station at the, the trailhead. And um, I see him getting a trumpet out of his car <laughs> and asking people about like where to go and he has a trumpet. And I'm thinking, 
that's interesting. And so I pull out one of my brochures. I'm like, do you know it's all about acoustics, right? And he's like, what? And he was like a youngish guy. I don't know, maybe mid 20s. And I'm like, yeah, it's about acoustics. Like, you know, JCR Licklider, who is the head of Dark Bell, like he was a psychoacoustics. This is about acoustics. And, you know, the stuff is coming up today. This, you know, have you heard of the metaverse? And, um, you know, the smart contract layer, this Ethereum merge is going to be happening. Like, and he's like, yeah, I think it's actually going to be happening in a few hours. And I'm like, Wow, because I thought it was tomorrow, but um, I guess it's dynamic, so maybe it's coming up soon. Um, and I'm like, yeah, I think this is really key to unfolding this metaverse, but it's the CIA's video game. And so at that point, he's looking at me a little sideways, but um, he's got his trumpet and he's walking into the swamp. And so I pull out to go to the next spot and I see some uh, goldenrod that I want and some ironweed and some purple, beautiful yellow and purple. I love that. And so I, I pull over, like on the just as I'm about to leave the exit, the the park to get my scissors out and trim up some uh, goldenrod and ironweed. And then I hear him, like I hear the trumpet across the swamp. Although it was just like that da 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 So it wasn't super sophisticated music, but there was trumpeting through the swamp on the day, potentially, of the Ethereum merge. Um, <laughs> So that was a bit odd. I don't know if that was in the, the CIA's planned video game for the day. So, but before, so that's frequency. So we're talking about sort of spiritual frequencies. Um, so earlier that day, the first visit that we made was actually to Lidditz. And Lidditz is maybe eight miles away. And it's a Moravian community. So Bethlehem is in Pennsylvania. It's a Moravian community. I'm not sure which one came first, probably Bethlehem. And then Lidditz is another Moravian community. And I'm particularly interested in the Moravians because I went to Wake Forest University, which is in Winston-Salem. And Old Salem, which started out being called like, initially it was called Bethabara and Bethania. And then Salem was an outpost of the Moravians. So the Pennsylvania Moravians um, who were originally from sort of the Czech area and connected to Count Zinzendorf, uh, they were sent from Pennsylvania down to, um, to North Carolina. And actually RJ Reynolds of the Tobacco Fortune bought his first buildings uh, for his tobacco company from the Moravians. So I've always been really interested in the Moravians and um, you know, for North Carolina, some very old architecture in Old Salem, which is another state historic site in North Carolina, um, quite a few 18th century buildings, which is pretty rare in the South. There are just very few buildings, especially multiple buildings um, of that age. And, you know, it was, it's always a very charming area. And, um, and then Wake Forest, which was a Baptist school, actually, but during uh, the, the Advent season, they would have something called a love feast. And it involved like little buns and coffee and a religious ceremony and holding these candles and light. And um, the love feast was something that they did at Ephrata Cloister as well, and also the Moravians. Um, so it was a Moravian thing. And I think that the love piece goes back to the Jakob Burma and the power of the heart, the heart and the light. Um, so I had very good memories. And in fact, we often would go to Bethlehem as a family and go to their Chris Kindle Marked, um, like a craft festival um, in, in Bethlehem. And for years and years and years, uh, most of the time that we were in this house, uh, we would hang a Moravian star outside during the Christmas season. And it's a multi-pointed star. And it's kind of like the icon of, um, of the Moravians. And um, and again, Bethlehem and, and the shooting star. Uh, so again, I have sort of fond memories, but it's interesting to sort of situate this in this mystical religious practice and sort of where it came from. By way of background, I've talked about this several times recently, but I think it's, it's, it is very important. I want to reemphasize uh, the role of Peter Drucker uh, in developing the Protestant pastoral megachurch movement in the 1980s. And he was a management theorist, his um, mother was involved in psychoanalysis. He was Austrian. His family was very well connected um, in the Austrian government. And uh, his uncle was uh, helped write the Austrian constitution and then 
uh, left in World War II and became a professor of sociology at UC Berkeley and was involved in international law. So you can sort of imagine how that's going to be with the superorganism. And um, a close friend of his father was Joseph Schumpeter, uh, who was a finance minister of Germany and Austria, and then ultimately ended up at Harvard in the 30s and was working on creative destruction and evolutionary economics. Um, so he was he was advancing that idea, and uh, eventually it, it sort of overlapped with the work of J. Wright Forrester at MIT Sloan in terms of simulation modeling and this creative destruction. Um, so Drucker was promoting the idea of decentralization. He was promoting the idea of a corporate sponsored basic income. Um, about he was promoting privatization, uh, outsourcing government to uh, public-private partnerships, uh, advancing the idea of the death of the need for blue-collar work, as well as working with Bob Buford, the cable television guy, um, on the Protestant uh, megachurch movement, including connections to Chuck Smith of Calvary Church in Costa Mesa, Costa Mesa, sorry, uh, Bill Hibbles with Willow Creek Church. Rick Warren of uh, Purpose Driven Life, and you can see how that might fit into cybernetics, and um, uh, uh, the Saddleback Church. Um, yeah, so Purpose Driven Life. So you can see how that all fits together with telecommunications. And again, the Bertelsmann, Unitas Fratrum. Hey, like we can all be spiritual on television or on social media now, right? Um, and they, they are advancing things like this, you know, metaverse church and shark tank and VC funded spiritual practices. Um, so the reason like I have this in here, um, it's sort of tucked in next to, uh, the Wycliffe Bible translators, um, and the Pew Charitable Trust who were connected to Powered Pew of Sun Oil. And it really just occurred to me the idea, you know, going all the way back to the Zoroastrians, the idea of the heart as the eternal flame and the eternal connection to the spiritual. So it's interesting to kind of think of the role of the oil companies. And I noticed on the um, Conrad Beisel plaque that Exxon, in addition to the state government sponsoring the plaque, that it was also Exxon. Exxon. So the role of the oil companies in, in the idea of this eternal flame, because when, when Hege and I went to Oral Roberts University, their very modernistic prayer tower had an eternal flame on the top. And of course, Oklahoma is oil country. So um, next to Bob Buford and P Peter Drucker, I have um, John Wycliffe and Jan Hus. And, you know, I had mentioned before that Jan Hus predated um, Luther in terms of uh, reformation and protesting against the Vatican. And he was burned at the stake for heresy. But he influenced John w Wycliffe, who was a scholastic theologian and was very, uh, Wycliffe was very much promoting the idea of access to the Bible in the vernacular, which would be sort of in line with what Effort a cloister was that the, the goal was literacy so that you could read the Bible so that you could have your own personal relationship with God in your contemplative setting. Um, so the biblical vernacular was very important. Um, and then Wycliffe was also really interested in logic. Um, and so the, the, the idea of the smart contracts and potentially soulful optimization, I feel like is, is there in the background. Um, and then many years later, this idea of the Wycliffe Bible translators came about, um, this guy, William Cameron Townsend, and he was a missionary that was going into Latin America. And his idea, they were creating, um, I think with, with backing from the Rockefeller Foundation, these airstrips in the Amazon and remote areas of Latin America and collecting with this guy, Kenneth Lee Pike, um, who is a linguist, uh, these indigenous languages um, in, ostensibly so that they could translate them and give them copies of the Bible that they could read in their own language. Um, now, I think that it was actually about collecting the languages themselves and that this goes back to the idea of namshubs and incantations and logos and the power of the word itself. Um, but this is sort of all going on in the background. And of course, the, the Wycliffe Bible translators and the, the linguistic work there, uh, it was spun off into the International Linguistic Center in, um, in Dallas, uh, which still exists. And that was funded by Trammell Crow, who's backing Old Parkland. Um, and they have online software that's connected, something called Fieldworks Language Explorer. So they're, again, think of AI and machine learning. And uh, Nelson Bunker Hunt, uh, who is a speculator in silver and part of the Hunt family fortune um, that's behind Pegasus Park, uh, 
was one of the funders of the Wycliffe uh, effort and in, in international linguistics. And so I would just say we need to sort of be mindful about the overlap of the word and collecting people's uh, languages and for what purpose and what that does once we start adding them into online software systems uh, for machine learning like these field work systems. Uh, so again, just pointing back that the pietists sort of have their origins in Jan Hus all the way back uh, to Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, uh, this very early reformer who predates Luther and was an influence on Wycliffe and then ultimately this larger corporate um, megachurch movement that's running through digital media. Um, so we went to Lidditz in initially um, because I have another friend who suggested, uh, she's like, Allison, there's a really interesting campus that you should see in, um, in Lidditz. It's called Rock Lidditz. And I have pictures, but I don't really have a good way of inserting the pictures. So um, I'll just tell you about it, or maybe I'll overlay them when I do this video. Um, so it's so Lidditz isn't a very big town, like maybe twenty thousand people. Um, it's it's very quaint. It's pretty affluent. Again, it's Moravian, and the centerpiece of the downtown are quite a few important Moravian buildings. There's also a boarding school that is evidently the oldest girls boarding school in the country from the 18th century, which is interesting that you would have a boarding school for girls that early. Um, it's also the site of a little pretzel factory. So it's the very first uh, pretzels in the new world, which is like in the middle of the 19th century. So it's not ancient. But if you look at the history of pretzels, um, Evidently, it goes back to maybe an Italian monk or something, and they were giving treats to the children for learning their prayers. And so that the twisting of the pretzel, which um, to me sort of evokes not theory and topology, is supposed to be children with their hands over their chest in prayer, which is, again, the heart field. And when you look at the, the pretzel, it also makes a heart. And in Ephrata, in the backs of the chairs, they had cut hearts out. So the hearts and, you know, I, you know, you make these hearts. So it's interesting. And, and then outside of the, the pretzel factory, which is across the street from the boarding school, there's like a fiberglass big pretzel, you know, eye catching, come over and, you know, you can, uh, you know, get the tour and make a pretzel and, you know, it's a tourist thing, but there are these big hunks of salt on the pretzel, which is sort of alchemical and earthy and grounding. And Lidditz itself is, um, beyond being Moravian, uh, was the home of Wilbur, I don't know if it's the home, but it was a major factory of Wilbur chocolate. And Wilbur Buds essentially predated the Hershey Kiss. And I think that the Wilbur family was originally from Philadelphia, but for many years, uh, they operated and they had a chocolate museum uh, right in downtown Lidditz next to this little park with a, with a creek running through it. And um, the creek is fed by three underground springs, I find out. I did, it never occurred to me to really look up, but water is really important. And that whole part of Lancaster County, part of it, this Amish country, it is so um, productive agriculturally is because it's underlaid by limestone. So these creeks are percolating out of limestone, which is like a purification process. So you've got the, the Wilbur Chocolate Company with the Wilbur Buds, which were always wonderful, but now I realize most of the time I was still enjoying the Wilbur Buds and I really liked the dark chocolate ones. They actually had been bought out by Cargill. <laughs> so, so I ended up not actually buying any Wilbur Buds this time because like now that I know they're owned by Cargill, it's just not the same. But the chocolate and then the water and then the boarding school and then the pretzels. And so we, we set an intention. Um, we set an intention in front of like one of the religious buildings next to the boarding school and it had a, a cross in the you know, the, the purple draping for Easter. And um, my friend Juliana had brought a lot of lovely things that she had shells from Brighton Beach and feathers. And I had brought some hellebores, Lenten rose from my little backyard garden, the sort of greeny white, white ones. And we laid a simple heart down there. And um, I'm gonna stick this one thing in because I forgot. But um, so when we were in Lidditz and we were looking at the sign um, in sort of the, the open lawn area, and it was for uh, the Lidditz community, and their logo was the Moravian star. But it wasn't just the typical star that you I normally am used to seeing. It actually had a big swoosh attached to it, almost like a Nike swoosh, and it was a little bit unusual. And uh, we had been talking about the fact that um, she spends some time in the Catskills, and in 2019, she saw like 
an amazing like starburst um one night like it was incredibly explosive and she said it had a tail just exactly like that it looked exactly like that so that was quite a synchronicity and um and I think she'd seen another one but that was like one of the most spectacular things that she'd ever seen in her life and it was quite interesting that um she saw it like right then um uh with us like right right as part of this and thinking about again all of the stuff with illumination illuminati light and you know me thinking about Michaela Uluru and her conversation with John Rogers and saying like oh you know I worked with some luminaries to create the future uh so I've worked with the futurist uh, <laughs> paradoxically in the past <laughs> and I live in the future I can say I live in the future and co-create it from there you know with with many luminaries who live in the present with us we had gone because this friend said you know besides all the moravian stuff on the outside of the campus is something called rock lidits. So think again, rock and limestone. And evidently this uh, company dates back to the late 90s, early 2000s, but they do all of the design and engineering work for these top level uh, shows, musical productions, um, including ones like at the Super Bowl, like the Rihanna one, not this past one, but the Super Bowl before with all of the floating stages, they would do the design and then the fabrication of the components to make those shows a reality. And there's like their own like private uh, air airstrip so that all of these major celebrities in the musical entertainment industry can fly into Lidditz and that the, the campus has its own hotel. And, you know, I guess they could go into town. Sometimes there's like celebrity spottings in town, but they they come and they they do their planning for these big shows. And, you know, I'm not that into music, but my, my understanding is within these shows um, that like since digital music, most of the income from professional musicians, like at that level is not from the sale of the music itself, but from ticket sales of these productions. And of course we know like during the lockdowns that, the music industry was one of the ones that they were the most intense about, um, you know, the medical credentialing stuff, the digital medical credentialing stuff. And, and, you know, at the top level, that's all controlled by like a pretty concentrated number of multinational corporations. Um, so, so yeah, so we went and this whole campus, it's all like, it had these big sound studios. Now we couldn't really go in any of them, um, but big black boxes. So they're metal, but they were all this like, like graphite black and tall because it's theatrical, right? So, and, and the proportions were a lot like boxes. And then on, they had accent colors here and there on like some of the awnings and some of the windowsills that were this chrome yellow, which is an al alchemical symbol for the soul. And so there were several really large studios. Um, and then they've been getting a lot of money from the state of Pennsylvania to expand. Um, and so they have like supporting companies. They had a brew pub, but they have their own hotel. And they even had a wellness center that was branded as Rock Lidditz. And the signs had big rocks piled up um, and they, they had sort of rusty metal and the, the, the rock lit it, the logo was sort of a, the lettering was, it was very, it was sans serif. So, and it was very thick, a very thick logo, but, um, it had, the top was chopped off, like at an angle, like all the R O C K, it was all angled. So your brain filled it in. Your brain knew that it said rock lit it, but the top part of it was chopped off, which to me felt like an indication of fracture. And when you look at the original logo, which they don't use anymore, it was chopped off because the top part was obscured by these triangles. And the triangles were overlapping and so, and they were sort of translucent blue and then they were varied depending on how many were overlapped, it got darker or lighter. So there was sort of the sacred geometry and the Pythagoreanism um, in, in, integrated into that logo. And then, then the triangles, um, visually went away, but the impact of the triangle stayed. So it was like a shadow effect on this logo that you wouldn't know if you hadn't seen it. But I think the Pythagoreanism is, is very important. So, um, so you've got this corrugated, like the heavy rusty metal, you've got the, the logo cut out, rock lit it, and then on the edge of it is a cairn of stones. Um, and there were at least two different signs that we saw this way. So the 
it's like if you imagine a pile of maybe eight large rocks stacked and that the edge of the, the metal was cut so that they just wedded together, the, 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 the metal and the, um, and the stones themselves. So that felt very ritualistic. And so we ended up making a heart on the grass opposite the hotel, up down from the brew pub and the wellness center. Um, yeah, and look up like uh, Rock Lidditz Wellness because it's connected to Penn Medicine. So it's like branded with Penn Medicine and Rock Lidditz and it's holistic. So don't worry, it's holistic, right? Because we know that the long game is managed wellness. And there were these very strange, um, there were three of these strange sort of sacred geometry structures. And they were on um, sort of a metal um, structure, like a pallet almost. So they didn't look permanently affixed. They weren't in concrete, um, but they were there on purpose and there were three of them. It wasn't like someone had just like offloaded a semi and they were going to, they were sort of jumbled up and they were going to get back to them. They were definitely placed and there were three um, and they were they were sort of shaped like this and then they went up to a triangle and within it were sort of bronze-ish, silver to bronze uh, webbing of metal that made uh, squares, but they were sort of bendy depending on the size of like squares and rectangles, like diamonds, they were on a pivot. And I asked um, Steffers and Sean, I was like, what do you guys make of these? And um, and initially we, we thought like Tesseract or a hypercube because um, it did sort of feel like that. And um, sort of the, this time dimension, like maybe there's something called this Minkowski principle of like the cone of the past and the present. And then as you approach the moment, it's like this point, like an hourglass, right? Like, you know, this way and then this way. And then the point is, is the present where it gets solidified. And so these shapes went up to sort of a point. And I was like, well, maybe, maybe that is the hypercube towards a particular point in time. So we, um, yeah, so we laid out a heart there um, and I had some flowers. I've been trying to decorate the house with flowers to impress the realtors and for the open houses. And I, I ended up treating myself because the store that I go to, um, you know, it's not a florist. It's just, you know, you just buy them yeah, at the grocery, but it, it varies like depending on the, the ones I've got this week were different from last week. And there was a, a bouquet that was a little pricier and I've been trying to sort of be more mindful of that. Um, but it was full of sunflowers. And I know that's sort of like the thing that reminds me of my dad. So I'm like, my dad would want me to splurge and get the sunflower bouquet. So anyway, so the sunflower bouquet is the new one, but the old one had some lime green mums. So we, we did an outline with the um, shells from Brighton Beach, which were sort of white and sort of a pretty blue, um, purpley blue shade. And so we did that. And then we, um, uh, my friend Juliana brought some pine cones. We put pine cones around and then we put oyster shells around. And then there was some sedum that was this bright magenta. So I dropped the sedum on the oyster shells. And I think she must have brought it. There was like a little fairy, <laughs> like a little, like a leprechaun fairy. We put that on there. And um, I had brought a rose quartz from home. So I had a rose quartz and there was a piece of birch bark and we drew a heart on the birch bark. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, so we laid that all down in the middle of the um, the hypercube platonic solid things. <laughs> um, but for me, it's like what was what was rippling through was this idea of rock and spectacle, right, and frequency, and in in these black boxes, right, and. While if you Google um, rock lit, it's like Amish country or something, there'll be all these articles that will come up. And, and again, you wouldn't know if you didn't, if I didn't tell you, you know, but once you know to put that in, you do. And there, it's an incredible amount of coverage, like Rolling Stone and Wired Magazine, all these like, can you imagine what's in Amish country? It's these, you know, top, top rock stars who are showing up. Um, and it was saying that the, uh, 
the company, now the first, the woman who was the first employee, and I, I don't have her name with me right off, but she started out working for Boeing. So she was working on defense contracting for the Army and Navy for Boeing, and then she went over to Bose, and then she went to Rocklet it. So um, again, we see this frequency as weapon system, right? Like the, the full through line. Um, and it's obscured. But again, it's probably a major employer and bringing a lot of money into this community. But it's a black box, right? It's a black box. And so I'm thinking about the frequency. And, and again, and I'm thinking about effort of cloister. Oh, and at the cloister, we did make a heart with um, at Conrad Beisel's uh, grave. He, he was in like, like a little I don't know, raised tombstone, what do you call it? Um, you know, the up, up, you know, like the bed kind. <laughs> and we, um, and so we, we were sort of running a little bit out of stuff. We'd use stuff at, in Lidditz, a lot of it. Um, and so we, we were making a small one. And um, I, I'm always, I always get stressed out about like, how do I make the outside of the heart? Because that's what you need the most of is to make the outline. And as we were walking, it was, it was very rainy. It was a cold rain. And um, I woke up this morning with a sore throat, which hasn't happened to me in a long time, but I'm feeling better. And, um, and so as we were walking out of the brother's house and walking around, um, there was a tree and it was a walnut tree. And there were so many cracked walnuts under this tree. So like, you know, if you get them early in the season, they still have the green holes on them. Um, but all of these walnuts had been picked over. Like these squirrels had gotten to these walnuts and the shells, you know, they're amazing because they're, the brains, right? Like the walnuts are good for your brain. The oils are good for your brain. And they're, they were all these brains. So I, we scooped up all these pieces of walnuts. So that's what we used for the outline for the, the bisal um, grave heart. But yeah, the frequency. So weapon systems, rock, and the glass trumpet, and the hymnals, and this idea of, you know, songs coming to you through, you know, the sacred spirit, right, through the field. And, you know, I do have uh, someone who had taught me a, a, about another sort of more shamanic religious practice that um, the presence of the divine attached to song and attached to movement is is really, really important. And um, I do want to sort of take this moment to sort of mention that, you know, I have been to, like reading some about like Swedenborg and esoteric Islam. And increasingly, you know, as we're imagining this eclipse coming up, and the idea of the crossroads, you know, I did that um, previous podcast about Buckminster Fuller and Carbondale and the crossing point of the eclipse. I know that I get the sense that what's ramping up in the feed is a lot of focus on end times, apocalypse, and Abrahamic religions. And what I'm realizing is like Boma and these pietist sects and the, and the mysticism, I feel like... It, it goes further back. Like they were informed by Pythagoreanism. They were informed by Neoplatonism. And if you go all the way back to like Zoro Zoroastrianism, which was like the first monotheistic religion, the importance of Persia in all of this, of Iran. And I've had sort of a pin in that for a long time. And I know, you know, I mentioned before about like Pierre Omidyar and um, like the Middle East, but not the, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, like the other parts of the Middle East, and classical antiquity, and that as a crossroads. Because, you know, when I was talking about the crossroads of the eclipse, I was talking about X and these other imprints of crossroad moments. And I feel like time, I will say, like, I don't know what time is. I don't think it's exactly how we understand it. I think it's cyclical. And so I don't, I don't really ascribe to the whole ascension thing, like it's a one way up split sort of thing. I think it's much more about waveforms. And I'm very interested in this idea of Persia as a crossroads that like during these early years, Zoroastrianism, that there were intellectuals at high levels um, who are exploring ideas of philosophy, of logic, of math, um, of spirituality, of understanding how the world works. And that that area was this intersection between what we now know as more Eastern Oriental 
ways of thinking, and then the West, like with the classical antiquity, and then in Egypt. So there were all of these things going on, and people were comparing notes. And there, were, there was a lot of cross-pollination. And, and things were not nearly as separate as they seem today, right? Like you, you'll slap a label on something and then put it in a category and then position against other things. And I think during these times, it was a lot more fluid. And then even later, when we're looking at the idea of the Silk Road and trade across um, from you know, east to west and back and forth, that they were trading not just in material goods, but in knowledge. And you know, I, I've been a little loath to wade in on this because it's a vast amount of material, right? And there are people who have done far more about this in these areas than I have. Um, and my initial inclination is often it feels a little bit um, like the esoteric occult, um, sort of titillating, right? Like a little scary, a little titillating, a little inflammatory, a little meant to like come in and you, you we'll give you some secret, I mean, not top secret knowledge, but, you know, the information that you'll need to feel superior to other people that don't have this information, it just doesn't feel as a matter of fact. And I think I would be more interested in sort of more of a straight up scholarly approach, because I think a lot of it, um, I've been looking at some of the early Islamic philosophy, and it, it overlaps with um, this idea of governance. So philosophy, the heart field, um, collectivism and governance, and it links up to math, and it links up to harmony, and it links up to frequency. And this is what the Pythagoreans were looking at. This is, it's not just gematria for numbers or symbolism, and not to discount that, but there's, um, it seems like music, right? The music of the spheres is really, I feel like maybe that's what we're experiencing, is that there are these harmonizations underway of the kind at Ephrata Cloister, of the kind you might see at Rock Lidditz, and, and, it, and it's ancient, ancient stuff that doesn't neatly fit into a certain category. And that we need to be able to live with the muddiness of it, especially in these times of culture wars that are really retrenching people into their particular faith corners. And again, I don't mean to say that in terms of that you shouldn't be a person of faith or you shouldn't be authentic in your faith. I think those are very good things. But I think that the the tension in the oppositionality of it makes it harder to actually see the whole for what it is, that it is more integrated than we may be led to believe. Um, and so this idea, as I'm looking at some of these early Christian texts, early, you know, the antiquities, the Aristotle, the logic, the math, that this is linked to smart contracting. This is linked to Web3. There, there are philosophers who are, you know, aiming for this idea of a wise governance model, right, of a wise ruler who will, um, unlike Plato and throw out the rejects, will bring people up to a certain level of happiness and to, to expect that, that they will um, rise and that, that we collectively will help benefit society, right? All of which are theoretically very good things, but I imagine that 2,000 years ago, unless we're really, I mean, and I, I, if I'm right about nonlinear time, maybe it's all happening at the same time, that there wasn't an awareness that you might link to AI, like link the soul to AI as the wise ruler and start to, with spatial computing, implement a logic-based collective governance model for optimizing human potential, right? I, I don't think that that was probably the thing they were thinking about in, you know, in Medina in 900. <laughs> I don't think that that's how it was working out. Um, but nevertheless, if you look at Hakan, Hakan Lau, he has a UBI program and he's within um, the Riken Brain Institute in Japan and working in consciousness, right? And working in UBI, that's called harmony, right? And, and to me, that is this integration model. And um, so I'm going to get back and speak more specifically about some of this, but I, I wanted to at least sort of give you a sense of my, this trip to Lancaster County. And then yesterday, I, I finally um, 
got some prescription. These are just readers um, because I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to take a driver's test at some point. And I probably should have real, real glasses on my husband's insurance while I still have it. And so I'm coming back and walking through the city and I pass the Comcast Technology Center. Now, um, Comcast is headquartered here, Comcast and NBC Universal. And there's two giant, the two tallest buildings in the, in the city. So one looks like a giant UBS drive, USB drive, and then one looks like an illuminated middle finger, you know, to the city. And it opened right before the lockdowns happened. And so I really wanted to go in and see the lobby, but I couldn't. Um, because you had to, you know, there were all sorts of requirements about getting in. And, and, and evidently, the former head of the Secret Service is the head of Comcast Security. So they're very serious about all of that. So I just took a pass. But at these days, it's more open. And so I went in. Because I'm just like walking by and I went in. And, um, and it's interesting because um, I think it's the Presbyterian Church. There's a tiny little dome church between the two Comcast buildings. And the guy who is the pastor of that church, which is a charming, beautiful church, but again, a very prominent classical dome. And I think it's Presbyterian. Uh, he's the guy who works with United Way on homeless stuff and all the pay for success finance. So that's quite interesting, like sandwiched between like the little church between the giant Comcast. But it's this interesting juxtaposition. So I went into the lobby and the architect is some fancy Norman Foster or something like that, fancy British architect. And there were these large ficus trees, fig trees, and they were like ficus benjamina. So I'm assuming that's Ben Franklin. And they have, they almost look like sort of like strangling figs. Like they have those roots that are wrapped around the trunk. Um, but then strangling the strangled trees were all of these white lights. And literally one of the trees was already dead. And they were, they were, you know, large trees, like maybe 20 feet tall in there. So you go in and then there's these escalators that flank the sculpture. That's super creepy. And it's, uh, it's got these uh, shiny stainless steel flattened tetrahedrons that almost look like a mechanical plant. And the stem of this plant is like a helix, but it's like a tube um, that's black and all bolted, like really heavy duty. And it kind of spirals up. And then the leaves coming off are these tetrahedrons that are shiny stainless steel. And it's probably like four stories high. It's very big. And so the elevators go on either side. And then you look up and there's nine lines of text. So think logos. <laughs> and uh, Jenny Holzer, the, the text visual artist, uh, had 17 hours of content that just so it looks like a ticker tape, only it runs like over your head. So not it doesn't run linear, it runs over you. And one letter at a time, and 17 hours worth of people having these various quotes. Um, and it's very strange stuff. And if you stand there long enough, you'll realize like sometimes it um, it's just like black and white and gray kind of the text, like dark text on like light gray, whitish background. But sometimes it'll like seize up and then run backwards. Or sometimes, once I saw it, it seized up and then it just disappeared all the text. So it's it's dynamic and it's it's all digital and, and, and flowing. And in such a way, um, the lobby itself is glass. And, and so the reflections, it almost looked like the text was flowing onto the little church across the street, like you, onto the dome, literally, um, in one of the views that I saw. Um, and then the flooring at least on the second floor, was all um, blocks of, of wood that were about this big, like, I don't know, um, five inches by five inches, maybe six by six. And they were heartwood. And you could see the tree rings in them. And those were meant to echo in Philadelphia. They used to pave the streets in the, uh, some of the streets in these wood blocks. And when I was first came to Philadelphia, there were still a few of the little alley streets that you could go and you could see them. Um, and it's kind of like the Belgian block pavers, but these were wood, but you could prominently see the rings, right? So if you think of nature being contained, so there were these fig trees that were already strangling trees, strangled with lights, electric lights. And then you had all of these units of, and, and this is a very expansive floor, it's a very large floor, um, of tree rings. And the rings were very prominently featured. And, you know, I was telling, so there's this also this thing called the universal sphere <laughs> in there. And um, there, there's a staff there waiting for people to get a reservation at the universal sphere. Um, and so I was talking to them and I'm pointing out the blocks. I'm like, this is time. Each of these blocks is a representation of time. And it's also think about the arborization, right? Like as above, so below. 
and the branching, right? The Markov principles. Um, so yeah, so that was sort of this thing. But now I'll tell you a little bit about the universal sphere. So it was uh, Steven Spielberg and DreamWorks, which I think is connected to Universal or NBC. And um, it's like a 34 foot high white circle and it's covered, I didn't actually touch it, so I don't know if it's actually tile or if it's plasticky stuff. It's hard to tell. It, was, it had a sheen to it. And they're aperiodic tiling that covers it. Um, so they're, they're various shapes that, are, that don't repeat. Like really, you couldn't find a repeated pattern around the entire circle that was 34 feet high. And so you, you're supposed to get a reservation. And I was trying to use my, my throwaway email account, and it wasn't working, and, and then... Like, anyway, like, because it's all QR coded and email and everything. And they did, I think they might be even took a picture of me or something like that. I was a little freaked out by it. Um, so if I start acting weird, like maybe I got brain zapped in the universal sphere. But you, you go in and Claire, it's interesting. So my tour guide's name was Claire, which is clear. You know, it's th interesting to think of. And I was telling her as we walked in, oh, do you know about soci you sociality? Because she's like, this is all about cooperation. This video is all about cooperation. And um, so you go in and it's like um, a planetarium kind of thing. And I don't really, it's been a really long time since I've done any ride kind of things. I never went to NB, like Universal Studios or any of those things. But you sit on a bench in a, like a little room in this round circle and there's a screen all around you and it moves. So I think it's supposed to make you feel like you're in motion in this thing. And um it's about, it was like a seven minute video, but it was all about ideas. It prominently featured children, prominently featured like diverse groups of children, but particularly children of color. There was a, a little black girl because again, they seem to be centered on that, like the STEM, which I think is the melanin stuff. And in that there's like a little girl and she's lying on a hill under a tree daydreaming. But that hill was actually a lot like the opening scene in the London Olympics where um, it was the Abraham Darby and the Industrial Revolution and all of the people spill out of the hill, like come out of the tree, like they're climbing up out of the underground. Um, and so, yeah, so then she's dreaming and they're talking about ideas and geniuses and how everybody has these important ideas. And of course, the genius is like the little thing between you and God, you know, your genius, um, your daimon. <laughs> um, and... Uh, there were ships, so there was a consciousness with the ships, and then there were the trees, there was a lot of galaxies with magenta sailing through galaxies and sailing through past important thinkers, but it's like not every, you know, your ideas are super important. Um, and really the emphasis was on the kids and the kids as channels, because, you know, Comcast is really very much behind all of the educational technology, especially for low-income people and, and digital access and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, so I left and that was sort of my day. But I keep thinking about this idea of frequency and looking at um, this idea, some of these earlier ideas about Zoroastrianism, the early Islamic philosophy, its influence on Judaism, its influence like the cross-pollination between classical antiquity and East and West and what gets filtered through also into Christianity and the idea of governance. And, you know, some of the stuff when I was looking at this idea of, um, like, in the, the idea of happiness and governance and having a wise ruler to rule the people that we collectively help each other to attain our higher selves and that the supreme unit of that was going to be the city, that the city was the model unit and that the goal would be to have that as a universal and that it was very much like the super organism, you know, that you would have families, families were imperfect, but then you would have neighborhoods and cities. And then ultimately the cities would all interface with one another and you would have this world consciousness. And, you know, again, this is going back to, you know, 600 AD. Um, and this universal consciousness was sort of a goal, again, of happiness. But this is where I'm struggling with this idea of um, collectivity and culture and choice because, you know, when I was looking at into Zoroastrianism, like it was monotheistic, but it was also dualism, this idea of good and evil. And the idea that, that God was a universal good and, you know, going back to some of this esoteric Islam that like there's this continuum of light and, and pure light is God. And then it goes further down into other, you know, 
versions of matter and reality. And thinking about, I have this map of Dallas and James Hillman and the idea of having depth psychology and the soul of a city and implementing some sort of spatial computing intervention on the soul of a populace towards this happiness potential that may go back to, you know, early Islamic philosophy. And again, not just Islamic, because it's the crossroads of all these things cross-pollinating, but thinking about these papers of, they just talked about the smart city being Athena, Athena being the goddess of wisdom and the wise city, and then Dallas being the headquarters for AT&T, and AT&T, you know, spinning off Lucent and light and being an illuminated city. And, you know, the model for this early city was Medina, and Medina was ruled you know, by the wise ruler, and, and it was a it was the utopia and the goal of having a universal utopia. And is that something that, you know, these telecommunications companies that are working in light and information and frequency are trying to implement in the next generation and in the children and turn them and release their quote unquote collective human potential into something and, and how we don't understand what it is. And we don't we haven't given our consent to it but if that's the culture then what does it mean for those of us who don't feel like that's the choice that we would want to make because choice seems to be foundational to everything and then what happens when we don't want to be under the dome of the Athena superorganism smart city or the Medina city of enlightened happiness um, so anyway so I just have lots of thoughts um, but yeah, if you have thoughts too, um, that, that, that the, this guy who was the philosopher, he was a musical theorist and he was talking about the importance of like Arabic music in terms of um, being organized, not by rhythm, but by tonal, spatial tone, something like that. And I'm not a musician and I'm like good with that thing. So if you're a musician, like what, help me think through what that means and considering um, the online platform like Conductor, the C-O-N-D-U-C-T-R-R, -R, which is the crisis management simulation platform, but it seems like it's more than that. And again, are we being conducted into some sort of improvisational harmonized performance piece, right? And is the protocol layer in the smart, enlightened city part of this? And is Hakan Lau's Harmony UBI digital token thing part of this. And, you know, not just to lay it all on Islam, because we're talking about Swedenborg and correspondences and the correspondence between the spiritual and the material. And the fact that, um, you know, they're talking about SWIFT. Someone sent me something about SWIFT and the rollout of central bank digital currencies. And of course, we've got Tether and the idea of moving from atoms to bits. And how, how does that tethering fit into this idea of a spiritual correspondence, right, of the material into the spiritual and then turning the real material things that are clunky atoms into more manip malleable bits that have a different kind of physics and that that's all connected to currency, but the currency is about the physics of it. And then what is, like, what is faith-based physics? Right. And and what does it mean that we're having all these conversations right now, like hysteria about the eclipse or hysteria about what's happening in Jerusalem or hysteria about like this end of the world conversation that we seem to be having? And and is that something that's creating a certain emotional state that makes us more um, susceptible to these larger shifts? because we will do it to be to belong to people to belong to have safety and belongingness as the shifts are happening um, so lots of questions to think about um, but I'll insert some more slides um, some images on the top of this uh, with the pictures and um, many thanks to my friend Juliana for accompanying me in the rain out to Lancaster County and so we could explore glass trumpets and um, uh, rye baskets and heart chairs and black boxes and rocks and, um, you know, and have some nice cups of coffee and um, put our hands in the water in the, in the special lit at spring. So till next time. <laughs>